What's up, guys? Welcome back to Wonder. I got my brother, Mr. Taylor Spiegel. How are you, brother? Doing fantastic. You excited? Oh, always. We've been having a lot of good conversations lately. We have uh, covering um, virtual reality, metaverse, and church. Hmm. Dating. With, uh, dating. Dating's a big one. Today's question is fun too. Our newest person in community, by the way, if you aren't a part of our community, this is how we answer questions. So if you've ever wanted to ask a question also, all you have to do is register on our community line 702-602-8802. And ask us that question. We are back in the studio and we will answer that question for you in a video similar to this. And in today's video, they were talking about um, how VR in the metaverse is going to help with the military. Yeah. Little bit off topic, but it really changed my life. If, if I could say that. Please. I did the Star Wars experience at the Venetian Hotel for Sandbox. Mm -hmm. And it was, the, it was specifically the Darth Vader one. And so you have their full on suit on. The ending of it basically, no spoilers, is he's starting to chase you and walk toward you. And they were able to simulate, uh, you're in heat, you, uh, fire and heat. And they were able to simulate uh, the force with the haptic stuff. Yeah. So you can feel the force coming toward you. They put a heat simulation of some type around it. It was completely amazing. And then that sparked right away when we were gonna talk about the military question today was putting our soldiers, putting the people who are putting their lives, lives on the line for training for, the, for, for our country in simulations with VR and how this is going to really change a lot of things for them, even when it comes to getting out of the military. So I was hoping you could share with us you know, your thoughts on the future of that. There's a ton here, and uh, I think there's there's obviously recruitment, and then there's once you're in the forces, how they can use that for training, uh, and then obviously what I think is honestly the most important, right, is once you get out and making sure that we, we care for soldiers and those who have, have served our country. Um, and I think a lot of what we're about to talk about applies for even think the police force. Um, same thing as well. They're putting in a lot of similar types of scenarios. Uh, but if we look at the, the goal of virtual reality and use in this space, it's a lot of it is in simulation. So simulating environments that a soldier, um, again, or somebody of, of police force or similar, creating a highly stressful scenario that requires um, mental training, precision, where if you have a lapse of some capacity, it can cause not only your death you know, on site and, and the death of those you're, those you're with, um, but also long-term negative implications. And, and so I think a tremendous amount of opportunity sits there in utilizing virtual reality and creating simula simulated environments just like yours to train an almost an endless number of scenarios that soldiers and those serving will encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think the, the ability for it to be flexible enough to have like, I, I think Sandbox VR is amazing and anybody who hasn't tried that out, uh, it, it's, it's, it's really a fantastic experience. Must experience, just try. Yeah. Even if you don't like VR, gotta try it one time. Yeah, and, and, and just so we you know, versus virtual reality at home versus a, an experience like Sandbox VR. So at Sandbox VR, they take a retail location, call it a thousand square feet, maybe a little bit more, a little bit less, and they map it out um, digitally so they know where basically boxes are. And if you were to take your headset off when you're in that experience, it's just a, a monochrome, you know, cheap plastic, you know, cheap hard, you know, wood walls with cheap little props that are, you know, kind of scattered around. It's not meant to be experienced with our own eyes. But by using these physical elements and mapping out that entire room, you put on the headset, all of those walls and all those props now become something incredibly immersive and, and more experiential. So you run into a wall in the game and it might be some spaceship wall, right? But you're running into it just a, a hardwood wall that's you know thrown up overnight in a real world. And so you can create visceral experiences uh, more so than you can at least today with uh, like your own home and just mapping a square to make sure you don't run into furniture. So those type of experiences I think really lend itself well to the military and training and the military and the DOD um, has invested heavily already in uh, some virtual reality startups and I think that investment in that space is going to be even bigger because if you look at sending someone in our armed forces out into an environment in uh, you know, call it uh, the uh, Korea, right? If we're looking at kind of North Korea and, th and that, that challenge, it, what are the scenarios? What is the environment like? What are, uh, what is the training of the opposition like? Um, what is, if you're trying to run night ops versus day ops, the scenarios can be significantly different. If you're out on the seas, how do you replicate uh, that kind of a naval environment, those narrow passageways that somebody might be able to encounter versus if you're doing desert ops? Um, 
uh, in the Middle East, what, is, what does that whole scenario look like, right? You can send daytime, nighttime ops in a building out, out in the open, um, alert, even training, like how operating machinery and equipment uh, out there in the field. So you can replicate exactly what it's like to have a $20 million tank sitting in front of you and get familiar while you're a newbie recruit sitting there, getting familiar with what that's like before you even have to sit in one and understanding what all the equipment, switches, buttons, knobs are. Um, before, again, before you sit in the incredibly expensive asset, um, you can go through all of that training and get exposure to that at early stages. And so, again, kind of let your imagination run, but I think, and you see this already in practice today, both in the military and you see some, you know, police forces as well, where it might be uh, just a large screen that's projected onto a wall. There's one uh, here in Las Vegas called the Mob Museum, and in there they actually allow you to do one of these police simulations, where you go in and you're given a handgun, that you know, a replica, right, so the weight is very similar to that. You pull the trigger, it might have some sort of action, but it's not a real, real gun, but it can be detected. The action is detected on the screen, so it's just project it onto the wall, you hold the wall up and you're going through, um, for example, I think this one was a grocery store, and you're going through what a robbery, uh, armed robbery scenario is there. And I tried it out, and your heart pumps and the stress levels are incredible, That's amazing. and I failed, right? I think I killed a civilian and I got shot in something to that degree. Taylor. First thing, that's why I'm not in that field, but can I build the tools to help people train? Yes. That's the key. Uh, so let's all go to specialization, but when you put yourself in those scenarios, even from an empathy standpoint, you immediately understand how stressful the scenario is, how imperative training is, and training that is replicable time and time and time again. Because if you can replicate that training time and time, uh, time, and, time and time again, that's what internalizes it into every aspect of your, you know, your muscle movement, muscle memory, cognitive memory. All of these different pieces are cemented through that repeatable training. And that can be hard or very, very expensive in a physical environment, right? You go out, I think like, you know, like if you go out to, you know, even here in Nellis and all these, there's, there's physical training buildings where you can go in and they have either live rounds or rubber, rubber bullets or, or a lot, you know, very visceral simulations, but it's expensive to set up again. And you're also bound to that physical space that you have, particularly at a military base. So if you have the ability to expand that so that somebody sitting in Nellis um, is able to understand a bit more visually and experientially what it's truly going to be like on the ground anywhere in the world, that's going to help them understand and you know, minimize that stress, have better cognitive focus at the time. Once they get there, it's less training that you have to ramp up, lower overall expenses, and hopefully at the end of the day you have a soldier that is more comfortable uh, with better training that is in a safer scenario than they would be otherwise. They're going to exit that scenario safely. They're going to have long, you know, first thing alive, right, uninjured, and then they're going to be able to return in a less stressed um, kind of PTS, you know, conditions like mental PTSD, state. Mental state. I mean, that that's imperative. And I think transitioning into leaving the military, uh, and that is an area of, of personal interest and focus, and. and you know, we mentioned it kind of, we're investing and in, in developing out uh, virtual reality therapy platforms. And with that is, I think it's something like 15, it's like 14, 15% of suicides, um, of adult suicides in the United States were from veterans. And I think the percentage of the United States adult population who are veterans is half that number. And so you have a disproportionate amount of suicides. Um, same thing with uh, those with mental health concerns that should seek treatment. Um, a higher percentage of veterans don't seek treatment. So I think it's like 45% on average of adult populations who could benefit from uh, therapy treatments don't seek it due to a variety of things, stigma and so on. Um, but that number is 60% for, for veterans. So you have, a, you know, you have a, a higher rate of intense uh, mental experiences. You have trauma that's experienced that, you know, through the support of your country, you have these uh, horrendous trauma experiences. And then your support network afterwards, for a variety of reasons, just isn't there. And so once you leave these types of scenarios, is making sure that we can have, through virtual reality, ha allows us to create affordable, easily accessed therapy and exposure therapy treatments. And I can expand on that a little bit, but um, that's very, very accessible. So that you can lower the cost, you can lower the stigma, you're not going in physically in person to go talk to somebody. And you can make it very, very accessible. You can make it accessible in theory to any veteran, for, you know, hopefully for any veteran in the armed forces for free upon exit. And when I talk about therapy, you could have things like in virtual reality that's so great is virtual reality has been researched for 30 plus years. Now the headset technology is finally at a point where it's consumer ready. Um, which I think is the amazing piece, but there's been uh, scientific research for 30 years suggesting the positive impact that virtual reality could have on therapy, even over in-person therapy. So if it's one-on-one -on -one therapy, 
in a virtual reality environment, I, for, for a, a decent percentage, can be more inclined to share more open yep. and intimate information about myself. Because there's a degree of anonymity, there's a degree of removal from the scenario, yet there's still a very human experience, in which case I'm seeing my hands move. I'm hearing the intonation of your voice. And that's only gonna get better with eye tracking and so on with headsets, but that's, that's fantastic. And well, cost structures brought down, excuses, right? Or, or you know, let's say you, you work nonstop every day and you don't have time to go to a therapist. Well, this allows you to throw on a headset from the comfort of your home and be there instantly uh, and lower the overall cost structure. And so there's a lot of clinical benefits. There's a lot of practical quality of life benefits that can be had. And not only is it one-on-one -on -one therapy or group therapy sessions, uh, you can even do what's called exposure therapy. And it's a very, very effective, long proven um, tactic to help kind of call it decondition people to certain sensitivities. So a simple one might be elevators, right? You're, you're scared of going into elevators for whatever the reason may be. Um, and with that, you're able to desensitize someone to the experience of going on the elevator and you can do so digitally. Sure, you can have them watch videos or so on or do it in, in real life, but you can throw on the headset and build an entirely curated, scientifically backed, exposure therapy treatment session where you're able to baby step them in, if you will, um, to each step of the process of getting familiar with an elevator. You can make the elevator entirely open. You could allow them to completely control that experience. And as soon as, you know, they could both end the experience immediately or just take off their headset. And when you go back to the military, think, you know, PTSD, uh, hearing, you know, loud explosions, right? You hear that a lot from, from people coming out of the forces. And well, what if you what if you can you know, de desensitize them, desensitization treatment um, towards those types of uh, scenarios, and you can create almost an endless number of scenarios to maximize the usefulness and utility for armed forces type scenarios. And you're seeing some of this done today, but I think there's it's way underinvested. Um, the technology and the hardware technology is there, the software technology is there, and it's about the implementation. So, really, from creating a better experience on the training side that's going to keep soldiers safer longer um, until they're all the way out of the military and then once they're out being able to create experiences to give them support and to have them live quality lives um, and not be burdened by their past um, past negative trauma i think virtual reality is an absolutely phenomenal tool again clinically backed in a large variety of ways normally if i was hearing you talk about this i would be fascinated and i would be like wow that's so exciting but if it wasn't for my brother Calvin and his wife Junis, they've been coming here every once a month for like the past, I don't know, past six months I've seen them, literally at least once a month. And one of the things we, they can't stop doing is sandbox. And we've done every single sandbox virtual reality thing they could do. And so for anyone who might be watching this video wondering, you know, you hear Taylor saying that it's ultra realistic or in that scenario about the PTSD and the, being in the elevator scenario, it is so real now. There was one of these, it was like a jungle, a jungle one where, you know, we're stuck on an island and we're, we're on this like um, moving platform. But like Taylor said, th that room is probably no bigger than the room we're in right now without anything. So I, I, my, I, I know there's nothing there, but the way that the technology is now is you feel like you're moving forward when you're, you're just standing there. But because of the simulation, with the added of the haptic and everything that it's doing. And I don't know exactly everything it's doing, but man, it feels so ultra real. My biggest one, and I think I talked about this before, was we're climbing up a, a like the jungle and there's steps. I know there's not steps there. And I literally had to act like a, I didn't even do it on purpose, but because I, I saw that, I was doing that and the technology has gone to the point where, and this is just a video game for entertainment. It's even more exciting hearing everything you're talking about when we can implement it with the military and giving them real life scenarios. And you know what it is too, a lot of times in, in viral videos you see, how did that cop not understand this? If I would have been in that situation, I would have been just fine. When the reality is, you don't know that. When you're actually in the situation, you don't know if you how you would have reacted. We can talk big about, all the things, you know, oh, I would have saved that woman or I would have done this or I would have done that or saved that man or whatever it was saying. But the reality is, until you're actually there, you don't know that. And I love how you said you did the attraction of the mob museum. One of the civilians died, you said? Yeah. Or got hurt. Yeah, that's... It's, it's like putting yourself in the scenario of instant empathy. You completely wow. understand how... As much as, you know, going in, I'm like, oh, this is probably going to be a very difficult scenario, like, to be, to be a cop. It gives you a brief 
and, and not even a true true replica of the experience. And it's still just in a two dimensional plane. It was just an animated scene that was that was in front of me. Yet I, I felt it, I felt the stress, I failed in the stressful scenario, and I could only imagine to a partial degree what it's like if somebody has a gun and I am the target of that. Not only are there civilians I'm protecting, but you have no idea, it's completely unpredictable. You don't know what's gonna be going on in that scenario. There's 15 different things that could happen simultaneously you have to calculate. And in the balance is your own life. And you have a, you know, you have a family, you have children, and the lives of everyone around you, it's, it's, it's impossible. And so I think the power of empathy, I think is also powerful for this, is making this accessible to people to better understand what it's like in those scenarios. And I love Sandbox. So the guys at Sandbox VR have done an absolutely phenomenal job and they've, they've weathered a very difficult storm with the pandemic. Um, they've bolstered their funding. They're really the leader in that space. And what's beautiful is you actually dive back the economics of their business model. It's very, very successful. They're kind of money printing machines because once you figure out the software layer, you don't even have to change the layout. So again, you're building out, call it a thousand square foot space. They might have two, I'm not entirely sure. You build some you know, very cheap construction because you just kind of need some hard walls, a few physical props. The rest can be done entirely digitally and you can use the same space so that that wall that exists in uh, a naval carrier now becomes the wall of a dwelling that's in Saudi Arabia, wherever it may be. Um, you, can, you can change that same scenario where you, you replicate the feeling, the nature of it. It can be during a storm, it can be during the day, it can be at night. You know, that kind of wobbly scenario you can try to replicate. Smoke in an environment, incre uh, decreased visibility, night vision. All of these different pieces can be done in a fairly economic way. And if you can do it in a fairly economic way, you can then expand the number of scenarios and make them more in-depth which I think is really powerful, right? It's not just about printing money and spending as much as possible, it's can you create a very scalable, economically feasible way to expand the offerings um, that you can create for the military. I love Sandbox, I encourage anybody to try it. They're, they're across the country, they, are, they have been expanding. But as soon as you go through that experience once, or even a, a kind of the, the blended scenario I had at the Mob Museum, you understand the absolute potential uh, and the power of, of, what, of what can be done because you're you're living in it, you're, and you don't even question it for you don't even question it for a second. Your mind becomes laser focused on that. So I think there's an incredible amount of investment that should be more investment should be done in the space, and I think it's going to be great not only for entertainment purposes but be incredibly valuable um, to those who protect us. Beautiful. And if you are watching this and you have an idea or you yourself. Um, want to build out an experience, whether it's for entertainment or whether it's for real life experiences, how do we get a hold of Wonder? Uh, so obviously YouTube, where hopefully you're viewing this content, so youtube.com slash wonder. Um, you can also find us at wonder.com, W-O-N-D-O-U-R.com. Find us anywhere else on socials, we're happy to jump on a phone, chat, we're developing, again, investing in our own um, our own products ourselves uh, without any sort of external parties or assistance on that because we care about uh, this subject matters so much that we're putting our you know, kind of money where our mouth is on the subject. Beautiful, and we talked about a lot of stuff, so if there's anything that we talked about that may not have been in as much detail as you want, join our community and then we'll go into more detail when you ask us. 702-602-8802. Once you register, it'll send you the question that you sent to us and then we'll answer that in a future question. If you haven't already, like this video, Consider subscribing to our channel. Let's build out the tech community within our YouTube channel so we can talk more about this stuff and all the other exciting things happening in the world of technology and app development and product development and all this amazing stuff. And uh, Taylor, thank you so much. Thank Until you, our next episode, we'll see you everyone soon.